Yeah, so I'm going to talk about, uh, uh, you know, you can see there's sort of three key words in the title. Uh, Co-expression is one of them, so a long-standing interest of mine. Uh, brain organoids are certainly a, a new topic for us, so an interesting topic in the field, which I'll briefly introduce. And fetal fidelity, so the question is, you know, what is the reality of brain organoids? How much do they resemble reality? And we hope that co-expression can tell us. So just as a bit of uh, background about what my lab is, my lab has a lot of interests, I would say. Um, like a lot of computational labs, we're in some ways more focused on methods than systems. And so we end up focusing on a lot of systems. Um, but one of our central systems is certainly the brain um, as part of the Brain Initiative um, Cell Atlas Network. And this is just a quick schematic of brain organization showing that you know, it's a very complex system. It's almost, uh, you know, uh, underselling it to call it a complex organ. It's, it's very, very complex compared to any organ um, with a lot of structure and substructure and interesting homologies across species and interesting ways of comparing it. Lots of cellular phenotype variability, um, lots and lots of kind of very subtle information uh, present, you know, which people have observed ever since Ramon and Cajal. And so, um, one of the central ways people have looked to understand that complex organization is with um, cell types. So seeing cell types and their interactions as you know, wiring diagrams in a larger network. And uh, you know, neuroscience uh, for a long time, I would say, has been bedeviled by how to define the parts list of, of its circuitry. So what cell types were exactly um, remained relatively unclear until, until let's say recently, Still might not be clear now, but um, th there was certainly an awful lot of excitement about single cell RNA seq as a way of, uh, you know, the, the word unbiased is used a lot as a way of rationally coming up with definitions for cell types. So we could define them and then we could come up with numbers and functions and compositions and define patterns. So, really, neuroscience in the last few years, I think, has been quite transformed by the search um, with success for uh, definitions for cell types in RNA sequencing. And NIH left on this, you know, and funded the Brain Initiative Cell Atlas Network, formerly the Brain Initiative Cell Census Network. It's a very, very large scale effort to understand um, cell types within the brain. Uh, the mouse work, I would say, is largely completed, so it's largely moved on to human. Last year, there was a, a short um, uh, prelude version published on the motor cortex, which was a special issue of nature, um, the more complete whole mouse data is now available internally and is being submitted for the next kind of round of papers and the human data is being is gearing and it differs from some cell atlas work in that it was always intended to be multimodal because really cells in the brain are multimodal to an unusual degree so that you know you want to know connectivity certainly in most for the most cell types you probably want to know epigenetic features and transcriptional features and if you could get them you know other ones proteomic or not or, or others but in the brain, you know, spatial location is being used almost to define cell types at, at points in history. Um, connectivity is clearly central. So there are lots of features that were envisioned as part of the cell atlas network. Um, my group focuses on the functional genomic features and their replicability across different laboratories. So doing integrated meta-analyses, looking at co-expression, um, broad patterns across lots and lots of data. Um, but the, the, I would say one of the key features that distinguishes the effort as a whole from, from some more um, targeted efforts is this, this sense that there should be lots of modes of data collected. Uh, but the primary one, as with all these efforts, is still transcription. And you can see the sort of data that, that's generated in other systems at the bottom um, and across. The most cortex data was uh, from, from the Allen Brain Institute, Allen Institute for Brain Science, is a central uh, resource. Um, but you know these are the, the kind of plots that many of you will be familiar with, whether they're T-SNEs or UMAPs, where every point is a cell. You get these clusters fairly naturally, these groups of cells that in low dimensional space are close together, and that defines cell types. And it looks like uh, these are pretty um, reasonable ways of defining cell types within the brain. So we do end up with rationally defined, well-defined cell types within the brain. And so one of our interests was in using these um, you know, coherently defined cell types or consistently defined cell types as a way of exploring complex systems. So if, if cells are building blocks for systems and, and they are you know, well-defined building blocks now, can we use them to look at other systems and see whether those systems um, 
are similar or different from one another. So for example, you might look at sulfites in the mouse and humans and say, um, these building blocks are different. And one of the systems that's most controversial or most open to discussion about its similarity to, to humans um, are neural organoids. So neural organoids are really cool. It turns out that cells, you basically 3D culture them, produce these structures that look fairly like brains. You can, you know, you can 3D culture cells of different types and push them in slightly different directions and end up with things that look like different types of organs. Um, and you end up with things that, you know, they are organoid-like, so they are, they are like organs. Um, and the hope, so there's a lot of interest in these, this as a potential way of getting around the um, translational efficacy of mice. So some people would argue that organoids are closer to humans than mice because they can be derived from human tissue, so they're 3D human cell cultures. On the other hand, they aren't like mice in the sense that they aren't true behaving, you know, mammalian systems. And so I would say there, there's really a, a pretty um, strong split right now as to the degree to which organoids are real or uh, strongly similar to human or good translational models. The hope is that if you could use them as translational models, that would have a lot of potential significance for you know, drug development. Suddenly you can screen things more rapidly. You could do personalized medicine. It's, you could derive organoids in a uh, patient specific way, which is people try that for, for example, for pancreatic cancer. So there's there's a lot of interest in um, their utility. On the other hand, uh, they don't resemble human brains in, in certain ways. So they don't, organoids in general don't resemble human tissues in certain ways. And so there's this debate back and forth, you know, uh, in what ways do they and what ways don't they? And this is just a schematic uh, showing that in, at least in brain development, you could imagine that there's a big question mark over what parts of the pattern, you know, the developmental progression you're correctly capturing. You could even think of this as moving down the Waddington landscape as a really simplified Waddington landscape where cells are moving down um, and you end up with different cell types. Maybe some, maybe the answer isn't that organoids do or don't resemble human brains. Maybe the answer is that it does in some ways and not in others. So maybe it very closely resembles um, it for neuronal cell types or excitatory cell types, but not non-neuronal. So they usually lack um, you know, vasculature, for example. So they, they might not resemble it in certain important ways. They might not capture temporal variation. Maybe they capture it at a particular time point um, or not capture regional variation. And a lot of this is uh, really, really challenging to assay because um, organoid procedures vary pretty, pretty strongly from lab to lab. It's really hard to tell, uh, you know, it's really hard to get consistent methods, I would say, across labs where you know that major potential technical effects are being controlled for. So we, we just in general have a challenge even characterizing what's going on in the data. Everyone will claim their data is fantastic, so that doesn't help that much. Um, and so it really becomes um, an impediment to progress that we can't observe how we're doing, loop back around and say, no, these ones worked, these ones didn't, these ones resemble fetal development, these, ones, these organoids don't. Therefore, let's go with this procedure or that. So really, I think the, the field as a whole is held back from making progress by the lack of an actionable metric for characterizing the translation, translational um, efficacy of the, of the models. And so that's, our, that's the goal of this project, is to drive a quality control metric. It's a very um, humble sounding task, I hope, which is, you know, we, but, but to kind of grand in its aspiration, which is really to say whether these organoids resemble real biological systems um, but it's humble in the sense that we it's just quality control on the data. Are these particular, is this particular sample set look good as defined by its fidelity to fetal programs? And so our strategy, the, the, the assumption going into this, so um, this is the project of a, I should say as background, this is the project of a student, I'll mention at the end of course too, Jonathan Warner in my lab, and we're just prepping the manuscript for submission. So all feedback is very gratefully received as we you know tweak it um, you know, or include any additional arguments. But our assumption going in was that, uh, you know, people are splitters or lumpers. More people are splitters than lumpers. This is kind of a lumping project. We're trying to group all data together. And that the response that we might get is kind of a split style response. Um, again, splitters versus lumpers, a terminology from Darwin about the way people talk about species. But this project is very much about lumping data together. But of course, people generating their organoids could say, well, yes, it doesn't resemble this you know, it doesn't resemble fetal data of this age, but if you match the age identically, 
if only you knew what age we were supposed to do, we were we, we correctly captured, it would work perfectly. So that there might be, um, that there could always be an argument was the concern that, you know, we say this, this these samples don't resemble fetal samples in a lot of important ways. And they said, well, you just haven't picked the exact right fetal sample. You're capturing the wrong brain regions or the wrong stage of development or some some other feature where they claim it still maps to biological reality, but not um, not not the general reality we're capturing. Because obviously we have to group a lot of data together. We can't, it would be very challenging to map every single organoid sample to, to the best mapping fetal sample because the fetal data itself may have problems. And so our strategy around this is to come up, there are still transcriptional features that are universal to fetal data. So, um, you know, there are certain features of fetal um, expression data that are going to be common to all fetal expression data. And uh, that, that's, for example, true of, let's say, human versus mouse data, right? If you cluster the gene expression data of humans and mice, it forms, it does separate out by species. If you cluster by tissue, you will also separate out by tissue. So th that's a statement that there are expression programs that are distinct to those systems. And we can certainly think that we might find them that are characteristic of fetal data as a whole. So that doesn't mean we're capturing every single property of fetal data. But it does, what we're hoping to find is the properties that are common across all fetal data. And then those become a good yardstick to measure organoids by. Because if they don't resemble fetal data in the way that all fetal data resembles other fetal data, then it, they themselves are not like, like fetal data in important ways. So um, the, the, the broad overview is we're going to find uh, cell type markers uh, that are universal in fetal data. So that capture that work across brain regions. So it doesn't matter what brain region you're in. It doesn't matter what data set you're looking at, what time point you're in. Again, there are an awful lot of genes to choose from. And so the idea that we could pick some subset that work is plausible, especially given the degree to which um, there tend to be, you know, recurrent pa regulatory patterns. So recurrent patterns of co-expression in data. So the goal was to find these, you know, universal patterns of um, cell type markers and fetal data. Those would then predict cell types across fetal data uh, in cross validation, let's say. And then we can assess how well they predict organoid data. That's a first goal. And then genes that are differentially expressed together are going to be co expressed. So genes that share patterns of gene expression are co expressed genes. And so we can use these markers and other patterns of, of gene expression to find whether co expression is maintained in the fetal data. And then um, uh, we finally use that to come up with a quality control statistic that we think works well and does indeed reveal what cell types um, you know, are not working in the organoids, what data set patterns I think we find in the organoid data. So the first thing we have to do is start collecting uh, data sets to assess and to work with. Um, so the, the starting point is the fetal data. If we didn't have enough uh, fetal data, then we couldn't we couldn't do this project. It wouldn't matter almost how much organoid data we have. We need the we need enough fetal data to say what are really recurrent um, significant patterns. Um, now, not all fetal, fetal data will be well annotated. Fetal data also tends to be relatively uh, low quality, I would say, um, for technical reasons. It's just hard to collect. And so we but we have a very large ensemble of fetal data uh, collected. So this is a, a fairly large or very large data set. And I, I would highlight that we actually like that it's from, from 37 different data sets. So we want variability from data set to data set so that we can show that things are robust across data sets. So um, you're only really robust to classes of variation that you sample from. Here we want that. That's why it's dangerous to only do an experiment in, let's say, male mice or mice at all. If you're not sampling from variability with respect to sex, you're not robust to trying to translate things from one sex to the other. If you're not sampling with variability with respect to species or strain, then you're probably not robust to those classes of variability. So it's um, often experimental design issues are um, inserted by, by accident by trying to minimize variability, but that's not really our goal here. And actually probably shouldn't be people's goal in general, if I can um, pontificate. You know, you want your results to be robust to certain classes of variability. And that means you have to include those classes of variability or you're, you're uh, potentially overfitting to something which is not robust to that, right? You're only, only work on male samples, for example. So the point of our experiments are to be robust across um, different laboratories. And so we are happy to sample across laboratories. 
can analyze them in general independently and then look for um, characteristically robust results. And so the uh, idea will be to find recurrent markers um, at different, you know, uh, when we have annotation with respect to a week, so gestational week uh, five to 25, <clears throat> different cell types. So we deliberately uh, focused on fairly coarsely clustered cell types to maximize the probability that we would get marker sets that should be captured across the data. So the difference between, um, you know, the, the most recent mouse cell atlas data sets have about 5,000 cell types in them. And so the probability that those are going to be identically captured in organoids might be not that great, it might, but it's going to be really hard to tell. But the idea that you should be able to tell a neuron from a non-neuron seems much um, a much safer quality control statistic likely to generalize across many, many genes. So on the other hand, we want enough detail that we can characterize which cell types are going uh, right and which are going wrong. This seemed to us to be an appropriate level for most organoid data. Um, most organoid data is not characterized at, um, a, a, you know, they talk about cell types within it, but it's usually at a fairly coarse level from a single cell point of view. And then we also have organoid data. Um, so here we have 124 different data sets, um, 12 loosely defined different uh, org, uh, protocols, um, including temporal, a temporal organoid atlas, um, unpublished uh, temporal organoid atlas, or just preprinted. And this is about uh, you know 1.5, 1.6 million cells, um, capturing different you know uh, organoid types slash uh, regions and ages. Um, and so this offers, we hope, a lot of scope for investigating what can vary from one organoid to the next. And just to give you a taste of what the data looks like in, in a conventional form, so this is, you know, T-sneeze. Um, I'm not sure there's, you know, that much to read of looking at these, except that these look like fairly nice T-sneeze. They're not showing that horrible, extremely coarse structure you sometimes see um, in, in poor data sets. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, it, it, like all data, these are more attractive, like all UMAPs or T-sneeze, these are more attractive pictures than anything else. But we do have a fairly good um, time range. Um, and for first and second trimester uh, fetal data, cross brain regions. And um, the goal is to estimate good markers by training up a model, which is really just doing meta analysis. So, learning over looking at what um, differential expression repeats in all the data sets except one, and then um, assessing how well it works at identifying the cell types in the last data set. And then repeating that in cross validation. So we just repeat that over and over again, um, leaving one data set at a time to see what sort of performance we get at predicting the cell types in the missing data set. And um, AUROCs are my favorite machine learning statistics. So people have a couple of favorites, but it, it basically maps to the probability you're correct if the test, if the classification were balanced. Um, so it controls for class imbalance that's sometimes misunderstood as meaning it's sensitive to it, um, which it, it, it's controlling for it actually. I mean, an AURC of 0.5 is random, so because it controls for class imbalance. Anything above 0.9, I would say, is excellent, uh, typically. And so we want to pick, we can have as many markers as we like. Um, we can, you know, go down that list. We tend to use non-parametric statistics. So we tend to use ranked lists as opposed to the, the effect size directly. That, in our experience, that's more robust when you're looking at large numbers of, of data sets. Um, uh, and so the, the key question is really how far down the list to go, how many markers is enough, but not, not too many. And again, we want this to be not that sensitive. So if the result is, though, you need exactly 73, then, then the whole thing is a bad idea. What we want is a number like, oh, you know, order of magnitude, you know, 50 to 200 or something like that, or 100 is sort of a reasonable number. It's important that it be robust in that way, because we're going to be applying, we hope this will be applied to new data sets and other data. You know, and we'll generalize quite broadly. And so we want these statistics not to be subtly you know, have strong dependencies on, you know, very weakly inferred um, uh, like calibration statistics here. So if you look, you can see the performance as a function of the number of markers generally rises, certainly up to about the 500 level for a lot of these cell types. Um, you know, but maxes out maybe at around 100 on average across all. If we were to average it, some start falling. The GABAergic, some of the less well powered ones will fall more rapidly. Some of the better powered ones will fall um, a bit more slowly, but 100 seems to give performance. In I think every case we have a performance almost uniformly above 0.9, um, which is very, very good. So per, a performance above 0.9 is high enough that we're comfortable that we're probably gonna capture um, real variability from data set to data set, that um, there's not much room for there to be performance variability just because we're not predicting things correctly, because we're predicting it almost perfectly. And so you can you can look at how these markers are performing uh, just with box plots. 
So if I look at, for example, dividing neural progenitor, um, and this is the gene expression of the aggregate, you know, the aggregate um, gene expression of the markers in each of the cells. So in the uh, dividing progenitors, it's much higher, but it's effectively zero in all the other cell types. So this worked really, really well. And some, so in the neural progenitor metamarks, it's probably the worst case because there are a tiny set of cells, a subset of cells. So, you know, this is, this is one of the cases where it's probably 0.9 rather than one that perform, that do in fact have higher performance, but for the most part, it's higher. And these ones, yeah, there will be some gene expression. You don't expect actually markers to be literally binary zero on off all the time, but the aggregate expression is much, much higher um, than the other, in the other cell types. So we can, you can imagine plotting this as a heat map. Uh, so I'm going to show it that way in a moment, um, where, you know, this is the different cell types. And then this is the uh, gene expression could be plotted as, you know, very red. And so this would just be a bar. And then I could do that for every cell type versus every cell, other cell type to generate a little heat map. And that's what I'm going to show next for every single case. And so the heat maps that would be working, the ones where, what I, you know, when I showed it here, this was high in the right cell type. Um, in my heat map, that will look like a block of red along the identity. So these blocks of red, and I can plot that across all the different time points in cross-validation. And you can see that in general, you're getting very, very good performance in every case, regardless of um, regardless of time point, regardless of brain region. Uh, there's a, enough of a, enough of a core gene expression signature set that when we assessed it, when we tried to build a classifier that works specifically based on that. It, it predicts every single um, data set reasonably well, meaning ROC above 0.9. And um, uh, one might have the idea, you know, in comparing this to organoid uh, performances, that maybe it will work only, only on early organoids or only on late organoids. There will be some pattern where, this is again our, just our supposition based on talking to organoid researchers, that there will be some feeling that you should identically map that rather than having this generic overarching signature, you should be mapping, you know, the early fetal development to the early organoids to get the right statistic. That would be dangerous from my point of view because it would mean that um, the the QC statistic, it, rather than being a kind of simple characterization of the data set, is learning properties of the data set in a highly specific way. Um, again, that could be useful, but it, but you worry that it won't be. And what you really, what we really like is something that that's more universal than that. It's just a simple characteristic um, property. And in theory, we think we should have it because from the fetal data, we were performative in every single data set very, very, very highly. So here we're plotting organoid performance versus the different fetal, uh, versus the different um, fetal time points for the different organoid time points. And so people might imagine a model where, uh, you know, the young organoids work with the young fetal um, uh, metamarker scores or vice versa. Alternatively, what we'd hope there's a model that, you know, there's some performance for young and old, which might vary slightly, but that really it's not, it's not dependent on the exact um, time point you drew the fetal markers from, that we've captured something that's quite jet, that we can capture something that's quite general. And so that's what you, you see here, that um, there's really not a lot of patterning. There is some, sometimes there can be switches, but everything is, I mean, the organoid data shows relatively consistent, um, gene expression uh, performance. There will be, certainly there are some data sets that are low performing, um, but it's not as a function of the fetal, uh, it, you know, the fetal metamarker, uh, with what, what time point the fetal metamarkers are derived from. So um, uh, certainly some data sets, you know, early or late may not be good data sets, um, but it doesn't seem to be patterned in a way that's corresponding with the fetal data. They're just uniformly lower performing. Okay, so to, to recap, this is trying to build up a set of fetal markers that we think we can use more generally. So as far as we can tell, we have very strong markers for fetal cell types at a broad level across time. They work across brain regions, they work across data sets, and they look like they can be used as a, a reference for organoid data. So the way we want to do that is um, to build co-expression networks. So the, the core idea is that if I have markers that are expressed in the same cell type, then they are co-expressed. And that lets me plot in this sort of matrix of genes by genes, all my, if I plot all my markers together, if the cell types are present, even in unannotated data, that's the key feature. So I had annotated data before, I have unannotated data maybe, but still the markers should generate these sort of blocks where the markers that were in the same cell type are co-expressed together. And so this is what you would expect for very 
you know, high performing uh, data, a data set where all the cell types are behaving as you would expect. They show the, the set of cells show the marker, even if you don't know what the cell types are, you don't, this one, you don't need labeled cell types. The set of cells would show the right markers, all, you know, the share markers still share the same markers that fetal cells share and generate co-expression patterns that, that follow from that. And so we can do that in the um, unannotated fetal data as a control, and you get this very nice patterning where the marker sets that were present in the original annotated fetal data um, recur pretty, pretty almost identically. So there's a little blip here that this probably could be swapped. Um, but other than that, you're getting really strong patterning um, that resembles the original um, sets of marker genes. The organoid data, you also get, you know, definitely there is some um, similar cell type uh, patterning, but there's more mixing in general. Um, so, and you can quantify that directly uh, with um, a RAND index, basically whether the sets of markers are clustering, how similarly they're clustering to the way you expect based on their shared marker status. Um, and you can see that the fetal in general, fetal and unannotated fetal are both very equally performing, very high performing. And then the organoid has this drop off in performance, a uh, pretty substantial drop off in performance. <clears throat> and so we, um, other than random index, we have other ways we like to quantify that. So we have uh, an algorithm, a neighbor, neighbor voting algorithm we use um, for a long time in my lab called EGAD. It basically votes, it holds back sets of the genes that you think you know the annotation to, and then sees if you can predict them from the network topology, from the color expression that's already present. So this is a, an example. Again, network figures. So again, previous talk about some network figures as well. So we generally are analyzing these for you know clusters. If all of the same set of genes that have the same annotation with the same marker status, um, if you hold back some of them and they were clustered very closely, then you could recapitulate that uh, that their status. You could figure it out again just from their neighbors, and that's what EGAD formalizes again as an AUROC statistic. So it predicts the missing labels on the genes. Um, the ones you held back, and if you're right, you get a, a good score. So that lets us score these plots and others more easily. And here are these sorts of plots for different cell types. And the key feature you'll see here, so you have fetal, unannotated fetal, which are mostly pretty similar. This was the first two, and then the organoid performance, which is lower. But there are some interesting patterns in which organoid cell types are lower. So the the, for example, non-neuronal is much lower, which is, so I, I will say that, uh, you know, like a lot of things, a lot of our results are not um, shocking. The cell types that we get as lower performing are indeed the ones that uh, organoid um, generators, I think, would predict are lower performing or, um, you know, not, not expected to be recapitulated as well in organoids. Uh, what's nice is to have a number to put on that for, for a change, right? So that we actually have formal statistics well uh, recapitulated as glutamatergic. Um, again, not a surprise, but um, what that allows is you to find the one or two data sets where suddenly they're shockingly high performance in some of these cell types. Um, and also to say, here's one that does a bit better than this one and, and so forth. So to really tease apart these subtle subtle differences in a quantitative um, way. Uh, yeah, so that's the, that's the general pattern that we see across cell types with organoid performance mostly being lower, um, not Absolutely always though. So you do get exceptions to that. And these are in cross-validation as well. So even the the annotated, the fact that the uh, annotated and unannotated fetal are mostly quite close is also a good sign that um, there wasn't any, there could have been systematic differences between the annotated and unannotated fetal, but there don't seem to be very strong ones, at least. Um, I'm sure there are there are modest ones based on data quality and you know temporal patterns of when things got annotated, things like that. So yeah, so this is again uh, coming up with a uh, overarching score that we can have. So we have we have it, one of these scores for each marker set, um, and we can calculate overall scores for the co-expression network. And then we can divide it up by um, the different cell types. And you can see, as I was mentioning, that um, you know, uh, fetal non-neuronal markers um, are you know very poor performing on average across data sets. Um, GABAergic less so. Um, intermediate progenitors, then uh, glutamatergic, then neural progenitors, then dividing progenitors. I think this this pattern is um, perhaps not exactly what people would have predicted, but I think it's actually pretty close. So uh, you know whether GABAergic and or non neuronal should be swapped, I don't know. But um, some of that depends also on the specificity of the cell types themselves. But I think that's 
that's, uh, again, an interesting and close to expectation result. Um, probably the ultra high performance of the fetal data is maybe a bit surprising. And the other kind of interesting thing is the breadth of performance. So again, the variance is very small for the fetal data, but for the organoid data, you know, different data sets, are, there's quite quite a large difference from data set to data set potentially within here. And so you'd really care whether this is your data set or, you know, uh, this is your data set. Um, and uh, also um, there can be different gene expression programs that are being captured outside of cell type. Um, so we can look at co-expression patterns for different, um, you know, enrichment of which ones are well recapitulated and which ones aren't. And then we summarize that in this sort of plot to try to capture which go terms in the organoids and which ones weren't uh, well captured in the organoids, which co-expression patterns were well-preserved. Um, and this too is not um, ultra surprising. I think there's some interesting um, subtleties here, but for the most part, organoids lack vasculature in the immune system. So it's not shocking to see that those um, pop up in non-preserved um, go terms. And then, you know, regulation of synapse structure activity in the preserved is, if anything, a good sign. So one question one might have is, you know, we said that some cell types are better or worse than others. Um, are some organoids good for some cell types and bad for others and vice versa? Meaning there might be no single ranking for organoids where some are good and some are bad. Um, but that doesn't look to be the case. It does look to be the case that you can just rank things. So if we just cluster the performances um, across the different cell types, you get for the most part, a pretty, pretty red block. Meaning that if a data set is good for one cell type, it's pretty broadly good um, for different cell types. And so you can, that doesn't mean it's equally good for all cell types, but the ones that are, are good in any cell, in a particular cell type will be highly ranked in the other cell types. They'll all be worse in the non-neuronal probably, um, but the, the, there are good you know, and bad data sets from the point of view of fidelity to fetal co-expression. And here we try to uh, characterize some of the different protocols um, specifying you know, which look like they're working well and which ones don't look like they're working as well. And this is, uh, you know, again, the same um, sort of plot I was showing before, uh, but now we've switched a little bit. So this is the fetal co-expression network again, and the, but now this is the co-expression measure instead of the, the um, differential marker expression in the annotated. And one of the things that's kind of cool actually is you do see a bit of more of a clearly a swap in um, which uh, co-expression network works well at which time point. So there is this slight tendency, I would say, we're still pretty confident that, you know, it's high, it's what works well in one time point works well in all, relatively speaking. But there is this tendency for stuff that's early to perform well early and less well later to the organoid data, whereas stuff that is, you know, late in, in fetal development works better for the late organoids um, and vice versa. So you see that, and you see that not perfectly, but um, across all the cell types. So there's a slight tendency or a mo even moderate tendency. Um, the, the overall trend, of course, is just, just high performance, meaning what works well in one case works well in others. But there is a, there is a temporal progression, a developmental progression in the organoids that seems to be tracking the fetal progression as well. So um, the, the question we started with was, are organoids a good, um, you know, how, how, how good a match are they to uh, fetal data to a developmental model, as opposed to just a model of gene expression? And probably the coarsest way, you know, the lowest bar that you'd hope that they match uh, pass is that they're a better, that they're more, um, uh, that they more closely resemble fetal data than they do adult data. So we have here the uh, fetal performance, the adult performance of the, of the organoids. And you can see that it's always below the identity line, except for the non-neuronal. So for the even for the uh, GABAergic, but certainly for the glutamatergic, there's this performance where they it's higher in the fetal space than it is in the um, using adult uh, um, co-expression data, even though we have as much or more adult data, um, except for non-neurons, which don't again probably weren't captured well um, in organoids, and indeed we, we see that they aren't. And you can quantify this too. So the degree to which uh, um, you know a, a given data set. So take some interesting looking data set, dorsal pattern, forebrain, organoid example data set. You can just rank standardize it using these metrics and say where does it sit relative to other data sets. So here we're saying uh, you know in the fetal data sets it would be a horrible you know non-neuronal fetal data set. It completely doesn't resemble a fetal data set for its non-neurons. 
and just barely resembles one for its dividing progenitors and is pretty unusual for every other cell type. Um, on the other hand, for organoid data, it's pretty ordinary organoid data. So it's right, you know, midline or good for organoid data. So this gives you some, uh, one hopes, uh, like nuanced way of saying, I'm interested in this cell type. Here's my data set. It's good for being an organoid, but um, I would worry if I was studying, if I was trying to make some claim about fetal development or developmental progression for that cell type specifically, since it doesn't map to fetal data. So again, we we're hoping to set this up in a, we're just about done where you have your data set. These are very easy assessments to do. They're basically, once we know the marker sets and we know their relationships, we just need the underlying expression data. Again, it's been set up so we can do it on unannotated data. And so you don't even need to have gone through your pipelines and figured out your, your clusters of cells and all these sorts of things. You can just annotate um, based on the co-expression patterns, which are well-preserved. So in conclusion, you know, we see really robust cross-temporal and cross-regional fetal cell type markers. Um, this defines gene set co-expression, which we can use to find really well-conserved programs across all the fetal data. The organoid data is variable. So it, it lies in the spectrum from actually recapitulating fetal cell type um, co-expression to not uh, recapitulating it very well. And we can use this uh, co-expression as a way of um, measuring or benchmarking or quality controlling organoid data. And we hope that creates a virtuous cycle where people do their experiments and um, they can check back later and see, you know, did this work, didn't this work and, and come up with useful statistics. And with that, just to acknowledge uh, my lab, in particular, this is all Jonathan's work, uh, just about um, a little bit of help on, on some of the um, uh, preparation of a, of a bioinformatic package. And of course, you know, all our data, we don't, we're not an experimental lab, so we collaborate very heavily with experimentals, but this data in particular is meta-analytics. So we're just thanking everyone who produced it um, out in the wild, including a lot of our collaborators and colleagues in the Brain Initiative. Um, and funding for this project at least came from um, NIMH and NSF. And with that, uh, thanks very much, and I'm happy to take questions.